as is usual the way I'm not dressed up today. I don't think Barbara is particularly dressed up. We are we are used to being the ones that you know the opening act for this uh, this conference. So we are going to be virtually the opening act as well. Yes. We we ran out of speakers to have three tracks for this uh, this slot, and um, we decided we would do a session slightly different. Instead of doing something technical, there's been plenty of deep technical content and stuff for you to get your um, get your teeth right into. We thought we'll we would lighten the mood a little bit, but with a serious with a serious message. Are you serious? Uh, you didn't tell me that. Yeah, we're going to be serious. We've got a serious no. session called "Even the Experts Screw Up." So, yep. let's go. Ah, that see, look, this is this is how good we screw up. Look, here we go. So we will click that, and nothing happens. There we go. Okay, so uh, hello, my name is Rob. Uh, I am a very, very professional person, and as you can tell, everything that you can see about what we do is totally professional and organized. And uh, once upon a time, I deleted all, and I mean all, of the slides and the demos from our repository for Jess and I's training day in uh, Oslo. And we only noticed when we were sat at the stage trying to set everything up. And Jess went, where's the slides? <laughs> So I, you know, I'm really good. Um, I, I once updated a thousand SQL servers and broke Exchange. Um, I typed Terraform. In one go. Yep. Impressive. And uh, um, 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 best of all, I once implemented somebody else's mistake that led to questions in Parliament. Um, so who are you? Yeah, I'm also here. I'm also very professional and very expert and all thingies. So I have a good thing. I am not a perfectionist. I don't require things perfectly. I am always worried about making mistakes. And still, I make so many of them. And one of the biggest things is I have a higher chance of getting a date wrong than getting it right. I try to invite people to a user group I was organizing, and I asked the speaker to come at the wrong date. And... It's merely a coincidence I found out in time. And maybe, Rob, if you can click through, you can find one of my highlights. And I've done this multiple times. This is what my, my presentation for the PowerShell conference in Vienna. So two years ago, three, two, anyway, uh, where I told everyone, look, these sessions are coming up on Friday. Because in my head, the PowerShell conference lasts until Friday. Spoiler alert, it does not. It always stops on Thursday. That's too difficult for me. And the good thing was Gil was in my room, so he had to shout out, that's not how our schedule works. And everyone, uh, we could make sure that we wouldn't have all the people there on Friday being disappointed. <laughs> that there was no conference at all. So another story that I have, you can get rid of the, the thingy, Rob, standing in front of my beautiful face here, yeah. Uh, I had the imposter syndrome nightmare. I was, uh, I created a module to, uh, imp a PowerShell module, create some functionality. I actually checked with multiple people like, why don't we have this yet? We need this, you know, that you think you have the best idea you can ever have. And I wrote a blog post. I had a blog, and my blog was very active back then. I wrote a blog post. I posted it on Twitter. And within half an hour, I got uh, responses on Twitter from people saying, doesn't this already exist? How is this different from? And I got a link to a module. It was crazy that I had actually missed that module. It was so big and I felt, oh, now everyone knows. Everyone knows now that I have no idea what I'm doing. I took the blog post offline. I took the tweet offline and I was like, well, this is it. I messed up and everyone's going to know. And you know the funny thing? Nothing actually happened. Like nothing. No one noticed. A few people who saw the tweet, some people were actually retweeting it. So apparently more people were not aware of the large module. I had lost a bunch of time working on that module. I threw it all away and nothing happened. Life just went on and it wasn't that bad. So that's good. 
we'll get there in the end. So we are your hosts for the day, and uh, we would like to tell all of you, particularly the people that are not experts, that what you see might look like a beautiful manicured rose garden with everything always perfect, nobody ever making any mistakes apart from Jason Helwig. Uh, when they're doing any coding on screen or anything, and everything looks to be wonderful. But um, honestly, in the background, what it looks like is is this. Okay, it's it's a mess, hidden yeah. away behind all of the chaos of um, making this thing happen, making the beautiful presentations happen. Um, unless you are an absolute wizard, you are never going to be able to type everything correctly all the time. And we want to just make it, people aware because this came about, this whole session idea came about from some uh, discussions that we had in Antwerp and just after Antwerp with a few people who were like, you know, oh, I've got real imposter syndrome, I'm really struggling because everybody's so perfect. How do I how do I get there? I'm never going to be able to do it. It's always going to be holding me back. So Barbara and I thought, well, let's just normalize this. Let's help people. Yeah. Let's, let's bring people let's through. Let's have a conversation. To... Yeah. And we talked about this and, and what I really liked, what I found out myself when I was in my early 20 something like that you're growing up and you're thinking i'm not an adult i mean adults know what they're doing and they have control over their life but they know what they're doing so i'm not an adult because i have no clue and there comes a point in your life where you realize absolutely no one has any idea what they're doing we are all clueless and that's when you reach adulthood <laughs> so it's true we'll get there yeah yeah so, so I, I, I like I like these ones. I think these these are good. Um, you, you'd have thought that somebody would have noticed that bridge before they got quite that close. And and who right? designed that um, that house? I mean, frankly, that's just just incredible piece of design work. Um, what about history? I mean, if you go back and you have a look through things that have happened. People in history. You've moved my avatar again. <laughs> um, th this one, when I was when I was researching this this uh, this session, th this one was one of my favourite ones. Um, it's like when you go around Dublin and do a tour. The the Irish tour guides will tell you that the Irish have been at war several times and they've been won and lost most of them. Um, uh, apparently, in Australia, just after World. War, uh, emus got out of control. And because the soldiers that had been fighting in World War I had got a lot of machine guns and a lot of other guns from being at war, they were let loose on fighting the emus to get rid of them. And um, they lost. They couldn't get rid of the emus. Absolutely brilliant. Um, that's actually, this is such an urban legend until you search Wikipedia and actually found out it actually <laughs> did happen. <laughs> like this was a meme, right? Nope, this is history. This is true, yeah. So do you want to, uh, do you want to talk about, about this one, Uh Yeah, what was this one? No, I have the next one, Rob. Okay, so in, yeah. um, in 1989, NASA um, had a couple of teams that, worked in metric and a couple of teams that worked in imperial and the fact that they didn't talk to each other correctly meant that they lost a well they didn't lose the spaceship they broke a spaceship it crashed into the um the surface of mars you couldn't make it up the spaceship crashed into the surface of mars because two teams were using different units for their calculations um, you think, oh, that's that can only have happened once, surely. Uh, yeah, so Concorde was was built by teams in England and in France, and one set of teams used Imperial, and the other set of team used Metric. So they literally did exactly the same thing. So you'd have figured that NASA might have worked that out. So 
here we go. These are professional people. These are millions and millions and billions of dollars of um, investment and uh, complications that we've got here that are being being broken by very simple and obvious mistakes. Yeah, so this one, this is actually a pretty serious one. I almost felt bad generating a silly picture about it. And I think a lot of people still know from the news the alert message that went out in Hawaii. Uh, 2018 this was. Um, everyone in Hawaii got the emergency alert you see on the screen. So a missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter, this is not a drill. Especially the last line is ridiculous. And seriously, people thought they were dying out there. And it actually took such a long time uh, for them to fix it and to find out that this was actually a test message. Uh, so there was a lot of panic there. And like, apparently they had two options to test this message, send it out with test or not test. And I know that in the programmers uh, Reddit, you could find a lot of suggestions on how it might actually have looked, uh, where they were like, yeah, uh, you know the thing where the screen loads, you click something and then an ad loads, so you click the wrong thing. You know, they were like, yeah, maybe something like that happens. But it took 38 minutes for them to tell all the people in Hawaii, hey, you are actually not dying. So we think that we make a big mistake when we make a typo in a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> we didn't send a complete island a message that their life is over. That's, that is just it is just terrible. It is terrible. So um, yeah, those things are those things are awful. How about, how about some good news stuff? Yeah, from history. What about what about Thomas Edison? So Thomas Edison was finally invented the light bulb after thousands, literally thousands of times of failing to create a light bulb. He just kept learning from the mistakes that he made to move forward. And gradually, he got closer and closer and closer until he went, yay, I've got a light bulb. Now we have electric-powered light, and it's changed our world, absolutely. We no longer have to read our books with a candle. We have electric light. And so many of the inventions that you learn about, whether it's penicillin, light bulb, all of these things have come from um, people making mistakes, learning about them and doing things better, just continuously improving. So when you are looking at all these experts, they too were always breaking stuff, making mistakes and moving forward and getting better. How about another one? Oh, and I love this one. The post-it note. So how the post-it note was invented. Apparently, this was 1968. And they tried to create a very, very strong adhesive. So they wanted that paper to stick onto something forever. And they were like, oh, no, we completely failed at it. I completely failed at my task to create a very strong glue out here. So it was like, OK, this is not going to work. But then they found this doesn't stick that much. It's actually reusable. And it was a few years later, like in the 70s, where one of his co-workers was like, we can actually use this stuff. And yeah, yeah. They, they called it for bookmarks. So they said in a book, you can use it so that it doesn't fall out of it. You can keep using it well. And the rest of it is history. It's really the history. The things that everyone knows what it is about is the environment. And we got that by accident. They actually tried to create the opposite thing. Rob, I get a real echo on my own voice, by the way. And I'm thinking it's coming from you, as we are the only two cameras. <laughs> OK, echo's gone. We should be gone. Yes, anyway. yes. panic behind. Panic's gone. <laughs> Why that suddenly started happening, I have no idea. Uh, yeah, it's it, it, Ben. It is always my fault. Everything is my fault. So uh, let's um, let's talk about panic because we've we talked a lot about um, history. We've talked a lot about ourselves, these professionals. So how about some some 
professionals. Thank you, Jacob. Rob, why is there a why is there a vampire in this picture? Why is there a witch? A vampire. The one on the left is a vampire. She has fans. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, supposed to happen. Ask um, whichever AI it was that generated this. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got no idea. <laughs> but it's a good thing AI makes mistakes. We, we don't make mistakes in tech, right? We always get it right. No, no. How about people we? How about people we know? So we we asked for some stories from people, and um, we got this story from this person called Fred. Now, I'm not saying that it's the infamous Fred of the beard, ex Microsoft Valley professional, now working for Microsoft. I know only that they describe themselves as bragger of toys, which to me sounds distinctly like Fred. Um, and what Fred did was he restarted the only Exchange server during working hours without a service window. And what that meant was that his entire organization was without email for an hour. Now, presumably, this was a few years ago when we had Exchange servers uh, on premises. Um, but he said that the learning that you should take from this is you should always consider the impact of your actions. Understand what it is that you're going to do before you press that button. Um, and if need be, as a young person, he said he should have sought some um, guidance from experts. But seeing how it was fixed by the people who got somebody in with PowerShell to fix this is what led him to become the bragger of toys that he is now. Shall I, shall I do Mr. Brett Miller, MVP <laughs> also? Yeah. He's looking good. Mr. Brett Miller, MVP, uh, a UK MVP who was completely happy to let everybody know that he did this, uh, deleted all of the wall boards from Active Directory for the service desk because he used dash equals false. Um, but the best one he's ever done was when he had to update SQL database, uh, SQL database with a new virtual machine after a migration. And because his T-SQL wasn't checking if the values were already in the database, it had to keep rerunning because it failed to migrate. Um, but the first step of the migration deleted the old virtual machines. So he had no old machines and he had no new machines. and uh, therefore, no way of actually getting the system back up and running. And, and this leads to this most wonderful of statements. Cue me, this is Brett Miller, MVP, not myself. Cue me, sitting at 2 a.m. in my underpants, hand-cranking automation migration script. So if you don't get it I'm right... pretty happy about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mr. Hamish Watson. MVP from New Zealand, uh, DevOps and automation wizard, uh, had just joined one of New Zealand's leading software companies. Um, and he was working on a migration project for uh, the very first online banking system in New Zealand. So massive project, lots of publicity about this. Everybody really looking forward to what's going on. Um, and he says a senior architect had modified the uh, filter that was used for round robbing all of the load balancing around the web servers. And he was told that this redirect was sat behind a feature flag. So what his job was, was to make the change totally non-impactful because it's behind a feature flag. That's what he was told. Uh, he installed it. And it immediately re redirected all user traffic to the client's new system two months earlier than it should have, without all of the testing that should have gone forward. Luckily, he said, the system was ready. It just hadn't properly been scaled. So they scaled and they, they went with it. Um, and the good part of this story is also 
actually something that's in, important in, in this whole session, is that the expert, the person who said this, just said, absolutely. I told him to do it. It's, we'll move forward and everything's working and everything's fine. Didn't try and hide behind it, didn't push it away. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. And the last one of these most wonderful stories that we have is, is particularly close to home. In fact, um, some would say sort of in Antwerp about three months ago, when, when Joe, our most wonderful Joe, who um, is the organiser of a lot of the stuff that happens back behind the scenes for Parachal Conference Europe, he makes sure that the event knows what's going on. He works for the hotels. He works for the food. He gets the sponsors organized. He is an absolute wonder. He is amazing. And this story goes back to a previous time when the presidents of this organization's New Year's Eve address was this major political event with all this protocol and uh, fancy pants around it. And he was the person who had to make sure the speech was there and all of the uh, all of the PowerPoint was ready. And him and his team went through everything, checked everything, checked it again with the president. Um, and then only during the speech did he look at the screen and realize that they were using last year's date for the New Year's greeting. Oh, oh so in the end, all the press reported on this from it being funny, and no damage was done. So, I mean, Joe obviously learned from that lesson, and he understands that this is just a mistake, and that he would never do it. Uh, oh, yeah. So, at the closing ceremony of our parish conference, when releasing the date and time of this very mini con that we're in now, what, what he did was actually say that it was happening next year. And he even got the date wrong. So, Fair play to Joe. Thank you very much for stepping up to um, to let us all know the mistake that you made and to to be honest enough to share it with everybody. And and I guess it all worked know, out because we're mistake, all here. Yeah. <laughs> so we got there in the end. Yeah, and now We've we have some. Here people who actually uh, not only wanted to tell about their mistakes to us, but also or their imposter syndrome, the things they went through, but actually want to make a video of video. this, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Yelly is in the room because I saw him already. So uh, but at least I'm guessing he's still going to be here. And I have full faith that the video is... So the imposter syndrome, guilty as charged. This means I tend to over prepare. And one challenge Barbara set for me for this recording is to do it in one take. So um, excuse the rough edges. Uh, this is one take, one take only, and uh, with very little preparation. I'm very vulnerable right now. Um, the the imposter cinema for me, uh, I have been a Citrix specialist for many years before I started getting my hands dirty with PowerShell. And actually, I was pretty good with provisioning server at one point. And I went to the, the user groups and I thought, well, maybe it's nice to speak there at some point. But that never happened. I always thought there's a big crowd of people, all experts in the field. Who am I to tell them? Um, what this can do or what I experienced. It's just not enough. It, it won't be interesting for uh, for those people. And that's just the thing. You don't need to be an expert. Um, you, you don't need to say something that everybody doesn't know yet. It's, it's okay to address a, a smaller portion of the people who are actually listening to you. Um, so now I'm in in PowerShell, and I went to a PSConf EU uh, 2024 this year, and I actually did two sessions. And it was, I was nervous, sure. Uh, also, uh, it was very fun, and I overprepared, of course. Uh, this this made me comfortable. It's it's my way, I guess. So it's it's all good, <clears throat> and it did help me because 
my my sessions were well received. I got lots of compliments. People uh, enjoyed them, and that gave me a nice uh, nice boost in my energy. I even did a community demo afterwards at the end of the 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 conference. It was five minutes on the big stage, so no more. Um, in, a, in a small room for 30, 40, 50 people, but for the entire conference, speaking on, on a very big stage. Um, uh, but also, that was fun to do. So, I guess my message is, uh, yes, I can understand you feel a bit like an imposter uh, if you want to try to, to address a, uh, a certain amount of people, um, but that's okay. I know so many people who went there for their first time and felt the same and still they went through with it and they they didn't die they didn't get laughed at it, it all went fine so if you're in doubt if you feel like this just take the leap i'm sure you have someone in your environment who can help you with this with some experience and perhaps uh, ease you into it so that's imposter syndrome for me David Church, and today I want to talk about mistakes I made. And I don't even know where to start. I am on this journey of career for over 15 years now, and I have been an architect a couple of times, I have been an engineer, and still every day or a couple of days every week I make mistakes. One of the, not big ones, but um, funny ones was that I was an architect and I made a typo in an IP address and I spent four hours troubleshooting that typo. Yeah. Um, or the other day I was learning GitLab CI CDs and it took me 33 check-ins to make my pipelines work properly and that's in around four hours of time frame or the other day I made an Intune remediation script the script worked fine on my machine in user context and I forgot that it's running in system context when deployed with Intune and oh boy it didn't work and it took me a while to realize why not. I almost implemented a proper logging framework, um, but luckily that was not necessary. Um, what else? Who? Well, I have a cat here. He's been. He is not a mistake. But yeah. Um, Mistakes are normal, mistakes are perfectly fine, even after 15 years or 30. It's part of the job. If you are just starting or learning something new, uh, brace yourself, you will have mistakes. It's fine. We all do and we share them and laugh at ourselves time to time. It's okay. Now go out and do your mistakes. Cheers. All right, so um what have we actually talked about here we have talked about making mistakes and we have talked about imposter syndrome and so imposter syndrome is one of them that i do want to mention and this is a scary picture by the way i just noticed the eyes on the shadow guy so when we are talking about imposter syndrome what is the part that we are talking about um, imposter syndrome is not just being afraid of making mistakes. When we talk about it, we talk about having the feeling that you don't know what you're doing and people are going to find out. And that's a really important one. So this is how they describe it. They say the sense that you are a fraud, um, a fear of being discovered, and you don't feel like your success uh, is part of your good doing. You have the feeling like your success is because of luck. So you're getting somewhere and you think, well, 
I have reached all these goals, but that's just by accident because I got through it by luck. And they're going to find out. They're going to find out that I have no clue what I'm doing. And this happens a lot. There is a lot of to, to find on documentation on this on uh, the World Wide Web. Um, one thing I really liked was that there was an, uh, uh, a part where they checked some research on how often does this happen, how many people have this. And the statistics said 9 to 82%. So those are the worst statistics I've ever seen. So like some people have it or all the people have it, but it's somewhere in between right there. But the thing is that a lot of people secretly recognize the feeling of, um, hey, they may th might think I am a fraud because I have no clue what I'm doing and people are going to find out. And if everyone has it, then it's something you can work with. There has been some discussion, by the way, on calling it syndrome or not, uh, because it's not a syndrome. It's not uh, something that you can get diagnosed with. It's just a feeling that everyone can have, or what they said online, a phenomenon of the mind, they called it. I really like that one. Nice. And what is good to know about this one is... If you have imposter syndrome, you are in very good company. All the people you see, you hear from, they probably have had that feeling thinking, everyone's going to find out. I don't know what we are doing. And that brings us, uh, if you can click through, Rob, that's my, yeah, that one, to uh, the question that I got inspired to, because I've lived it myself, like, when are you prepared enough? And the thing is, an imposter syndrome can not only slow you down, but it can stop you. It can stop you from getting to your full potential. Uh, full potential. So if you just let it happen, you're going to feel like, okay, I can't put myself out there because people are going to find out. So that is something I want to talk about a little bit and do notion the difference between a fear of making mistakes and a fear of being found out that you might not know as much as you think. And I think you know more than that. All right, so how do you deal with this stuff? How can you work with it? I have uh, put up some tips and tricks for that. Um, oh, nice, even this is not working. This, this is not the first one. This is the first one that I see. <laughs> uh, no, there's an anim animation here. Yeah, that's okay, the second the, one. The find help broke. We're going to get to that later. That's... Uh, it's, it's good on my screen. It works on my screen. I blame you fully. <laughs> uh, I, blame, I blame the cat. Yeah, I see the cat. It's always the cat. So some tics, tips and tricks if you want to work on your imposter syndrome or that feeling. My favorite one is to look around you. So there has been a trend for the last like five years where we start to be honest about imposter syndrome. And this is one of the scariest things to start with because when you start being honest saying, I'm afraid people are gonna find out I have no clue what I'm doing, your biggest fear is people saying, yeah, but you're right. You have no clue what you're doing now that you point to it. Now we know it. And it's a silly thing that can happen. And what we have seen these years is that people actually start talking about it. So look for the people you look up to and see what they're doing on the socials and see if they are telling you, I don't know what I'm doing, or I'm scared to do what I'm doing, or I'm just trying this stuff. And if you're on the stage yourself, you might be at a point where you uh, can come out and say, I'm not sure about this stuff. It's really hard to do that, especially if you're trying out, but it can be really inspiring. So that would be my first tip. Always look for inspiration around you for people uh, who are not afraid to show. We have no clue what we're doing. Uh, we we rarely do. Next tip. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, we're almost at the right level now. So um, when it comes to that, it is so difficult to talk about this stuff. Because like I said, you're putting yourself out there with your biggest fear. What if someone tells you, what? You don't know what you're doing. 
you're not capable, which of course is silly, but that's what our mind is telling us. We're going to have a problem here. And it can really help to find some support in this. This is something that I believe is so hard to do on your own. So we have the online community. You might have your coworkers, something like that. But what can really help is to have some sort of mentor. Someone who you trust, who you uh, can tell that you have this problem. And who you can find, ask for confirmation. So I have done that a lot. And especially when I started blogging, I had such trouble with putting my blogs out there and having that feeling of someone's going to tell me, did you blog this? This is crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. And they're going to find out. And if I was particularly nervous about something, um, I would ask someone that I trusted to pre-read it, to just check it for me. And if they said, this is just fine, you can post it, then I could post it. And it would still be difficult. Um, but I always said to myself, I am allowed to feel imposter syndrome. I am not allowed to let it stop me from doing what I want to do. And at some point I set timers because I think we all recognize that feeling where you're swifting over a mouse click to post something and you're taking half an hour to do that. So sometimes I would also give myself an end time. I did that with blog posts. If you watch my history, most of them are posted at the same time of day because that was my deadline. That was when I needed to post it and stop fussing about it. Uh, the most extreme thing I did it was when I did it with tweets back when Twitter was still fun and it was called tweets. If I posted a tweet that I thought would get a lot of reach, uh, I would ask something, ask someone. And I would just say it. I would have a friend and I'd say, can you just check this tweet because this is going to take me hours. So I know this is silly, but if you check it, then I can post it straight away. If you could tell me you, I can post it, then I can do it straight away. So I just put myself out there. I know this is silly. It's just a tweet. But help me out here because this is going to take me hours. And you know what they did? They said, looks good. You can post it. So they gave me exactly that confirmation that I needed. This was, by the way, uh, the tweet that I was speaking at Ignite in 2019. That was one. It didn't even get that many likes, I found out. I, I searched for it and I think it was like 80 likes. But for me, that was huge at that time. Uh, another thing I did back then with socials, with social media, well, especially with Twitter when it was blowing up like that, was I hated that it got out of control. Like, uh, not that it literally got out of control, but it was out of my control. So I just felt like, oh, something can go like a viral. And if it's something really stupid, then everyone's going to know and I can't take it back anymore. And it's not like that. And the only way to experience that is to do it. And I always like to say, fake it till you make it. I'm going to pretend that I know what I'm doing and I'll throw it out there. And apparently people like it and they're not calling me stupid. So uh, maybe I'm doing the right thing. And getting that positive experience over and over again. It really helps to have someone with you who you can trust who can help you with this process. And that brings to the third part. So I got a nice bridge here. It's like I meant to do that, which I really didn't, but it's like that. It does require, by the way, to find the help thing to let go of a little bit of ego. If you have that, to be a little bit vulnerable and say, I need this help. And you will find out at some point, someone might ask you to do it and you'll be absolutely happy to do it for someone you'll completely understand. So don't worry and try that. So the next thing that we can do, let's see if the click works now, Rob. See if it finds it. Yes, the system worked. Like this is the easiest PowerPoint ever and we can't even get that right. You know what? Nobody cares, so it's good. So the thoughts you are getting, it's good to always keep challenging them. Like I said, you don't want to let this stop you. Um, there are some techniques you can use to that. Um, 
some thought experiments that you can do, which will always help if you do them together with someone else, because you can easily get lost in your own thoughts, uh, especially if they're negative. And there's two ways you can do that. You can, for example, I always like to check, sounds weird, but what's the worst thing that could happen? Because often it's not that bad. Everybody if I think about... Hmm? Everybody will laugh at me. Yeah, everyone will laugh at you. And then? What will happen then? Uh, I'll be really embarrassed and that's about it. Yeah, you'll be embarrassed. <laughs> and maybe it can help if you think, okay, I have the risk of everyone laughing at me. What will I do if that happens? And if you think, well, I'll just laugh as well and try to do something about it, try to make a joke. If you can think about what you can do with that scenario, it can help you uh, to make it less scary. And like I said, keep asking yourself, and then? So everyone will love you. So what will happen then? And they will think you're silly, okay? Let's see in this group. We've got 117 people online. And guess what? I think if I do something really stupid here, I've done a lot of stupid things already. Nothing actually happened. Now we do something really stupid here. Maybe someone's thinking to themselves, oh, that girl's silly. But after that, they're not going to care anymore because this, what I'm doing here, that's not that important in their lives. They're going to go back to their lives, see something I do online and think, oh, there's a woman that did a silly thing and now she's doing a smart thing. I'll be fine. So there's one way thing you can do to check is the worst case scenario actually that bad. The other thing you can actually do is visualize something positive. So if you want to go for success, visualize what that stage would look like, where you're going to stand on and what everything around it will look like and how your session will go. You can even practice it uh, to help yourself get to that space. Uh, we do have some resources on the end where you can uh where we can go on about that but it's really good to realize like this is your head playing with you and you can play with it back and get back to it all right final one we're gonna yes we always have to say this this actually does get better will it completely stop Probably not. Always have some sense of getting that fear. Every time you grow a little bit, you get to a new stage in your life, you get to new qualifications. You might be like, how did I get into this situation? Because I have no clue what I'm doing. It might happen, but it will get better because you have that technique to run with it. And you will find out that it's okay to make a mistake and the world doesn't stop. And... Maybe you're doing something silly and you make it work. And one of the most important ones, you are way more qualified than you think. Because we always seem to downplay ourselves and upplay other people. You are far more qualified than you think yourself. So that's also a good one to remember. And you will get better at recognizing your own qualifications. All right, so if we can move on to the final one. One more slide, yay. I've got one more slide because I put together some resources and I... Yeah. And I, there we go. Oh no, Let's not click off everyone I'm sorry. was with their phone <laughs> in a panic. Oh no. Uh, so we should post these links actually in the chat. I didn't bother thinking oh, there would be a chat. I also didn't bother make short links because I was like, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ah. And again. I was yeah, like, it's too much it's like work to create short links. So I found two resources online that I really love. There we go. I added QR codes because QR codes are the bomb. And uh, these are actually resources that tell you about imposter syndrome, but also have some worksheets to help you to challenge those thoughts. Like seriously, that's I that's me again. No, it's the cat, right? No, uh, yes, definitely the cat. There we go. <laughs> 
So I put two links in there. They're very similar in that they tell you what's going on, what imposter syndrome is, and have some guidance on how you can put thoughts experiments out there with the second one uh, being a bit bigger. So the first one is like one website and the second one is like a PDF, it's pretty big. And we'll see if we can get it into uh, the chat or is it already in there? I'm not up with it's the chat. It's like... already in there. <gasps> magic, magic. Did you do that? It was the cat. Uh, yeah, it was definitely the cat. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I still haven't mastered to read a chat while I'm doing a presentation. Terrible, I know. All right, so that really is imposter syndrome. And that is making mistakes, and making mistakes is fine because that's the way to learn stuff. And, and you know what? We are absolutely 100% on time. How good is that? We've we've got a full minute left. Yeah. You can there do a little dance. Works. There we go. There we go. Dancing again. I don't know what it is, why people want me to dance, but uh, it's because of the beard. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure of it. Yeah. I'm sure of it. But yeah, I think the the important thing definitely is um allow yourself to make mistakes. Um, understand that everybody does and um, make use of some of these resources, um, whether it's in imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon. There we go.